Hi everyone, thanks for watching. You can support our work on our website ageoftruth.tv and please like our videos, subscribe to our channels on YouTube, BitChute and Brideon and remember to hit the bell for notifications and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. To be sure not to miss any of our shows, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website ageoftruth.tv great well it's great with the music in the background and uh, yeah yeah we're both yeah holding. at the guitars yeah. yep <laughs> absolutely well i think everything's good so i think uh, i'm just gonna turn on the camera for the studio with lucas there we go hello Hello and welcome to this edition of Age of Truth TV. I'm Lucas Alexander in Copenhagen, Denmark. It's the 1st of October 2024 and we have a hair-raising, a controversial and eye-opening show for you today. Our special guest is an American former satanic ritual abuse survivor, a child sex slave, a victim of mind control, a former Montauk project and secret space program survivor, an alien and ET experiencer. And since being freed and deprogrammed, he is now a poet, a musician, a composer, and a healer, and meditation teacher and coach. We have so much to talk about, and this is part one of our discussion with Alondra Markman. Good evening from Copenhagen, Denmark, and welcome to our viewers on Age of Truth TV. Please like our videos, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell for notifications. You're all very welcome. This is part one of a most extraordinary show that we will have today with our very special guest. What a story, what a life. Startling, horrific, and very controversial. And we'll go down the rabbit hole and get into a lot of very uh, touchy and um, obscure topics today. And it is a great thrill for me to welcome on the show, joining us from Mount Shasta in the United States, Alandra Markman. Hello, Alandra, and welcome on the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Tell me about what happened to you as a child and then later on we'll go into what is happening now and how you are helping other people alandra well i should start out by saying um i am representing essentially two different people's experiences um so there are some interviews where i speak from the perspective of the first walk-in soul um to this body um so that person was born in the early 70s um went through the Montauk project, what's popularly called the Montauk project, um, and had a bunch of experiences there um, with the Zeta reticulans. And then um, this body, so that, that person was moved into this body um, artificially by consciousness transfer. Um, so um, most of what you've said so far is from the reference point of this body, which is perfectly good. And I appreciate that. Um, I just want to say that from the get go, because um, I've just gotten feedback lately that people are confused that I'm telling two different stories, um, which is true. Um, it's my truth. Um, I, I do have more than one person's experience represented here. 
Um, yeah. And we want to hear both of your experiences and both of your lifetimes there. Of course, we've talked a lot about the Montauk Project on Age of Truth TV. We, we've had Stuart Swerdlow on and we've had lots of people on who talk, talk about what is going on there. So it will be so interesting to hear what you remember and how you retrieved or downloaded memories from past life. So there are two different lifetimes, two different uh, stories here to tell. You were born yeah. in 1987 in this vessel, am I right? Yeah, 86 in this vessel, yeah. And 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 how would you like to begin? Should we begin with the the you now, the the Alandra we see before us here and hear about your story uh and your childhood before we go into talking about uh what happened to you in a past life? That would probably be simpler. Um, yeah. Um, so sure. Um, so in this vessel in particular, um, I was born into a multi-generational satanic family. Um, and I'm, I'm just getting over being sick. So I'm kind of congested. Um, I'm sure people will forgive that. Um, so, um, yeah, I was born into a multi-generational satanic family. Um, and grew up primarily with my mother in New York City. Um, and my mother, as well as myself, were both mind control slaves um, in the satanic cults. So we went through very, very intense um, sexual assault and other forms of physical torture and emotional and mental torture um, on a daily basis for decades. Um, so it was a shattering experience. Um, my mother was also an above ground sex worker. Um, and that was tied in with her cult handlers too. So, um, so she had, uh, legitimate paying clients for her sex work, um, as well as non-consensual sexual assault in her life. Um, so, um, I am, um, the child of one of her supposedly legitimate sex work clients. Um, so, um, I didn't really know my father well growing up, um, but I'm fairly sure he's also tied in um, with these cult activities. So if mm -hmm. your father is supposedly one of your mother's sex clients, then he is unknown and maybe not from a, what they, what they would call a legitimate bloodline. Uh, but don't you think that he was actually one of them, these uh, high-ranking elite top, uh, bloodlines, the Illuminati? Yeah, they're both bloodline people, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, I mean, m this was not accidental. My my mother was also a breeder, um, as well as myself. So um, her sexual encounters were very carefully arranged. Um, and the ones where she had children um, were extremely well thought out um, and generally other people representing bloodlines the, Sat the Satanists were interested in um, would be matched with her. Yeah. So you were a planned child and you were planned yeah. because you are of a specific bloodline, I get. Yeah. Talk about your bloodline and how you could possibly be linked to the Illuminati and yeah. the Illuminati bloodline families and in what way and how you are also Jewish, right? And you've, you're also claiming that you have alien re reptilian DNA in your blood. This is true. Um, the reptilian hybridization is fairly standard for the secret space programs. Um, any survivor of those kinds of programs is probably going to have some degree of hybridization. Um, so I just want to normalize that and say I'm not the only one um, who's, I'm not unique in that way. Um, uh, what was the other part? You oh. are linked in your bloodline. Your bloodline oh, yeah. is part of the Illuminati bloodlines, right? Yeah, this is true. So, um, the, the, the Satanists, the Luciferians, um, they go by different names. Um, Illuminati is a fine blanket name. I'm, I'm okay with it. <laughs> um, they're very interested in a few bloodlines that usually connect to European royalty. Um, this doesn't make us better or worse than anybody else. It doesn't necessarily make us more or less gifted. Um, but from the Satanist perspective, 
um, they feel they have a vested interest in these bloodlines because they've been cultivating them for millennia, for a very, very long time. Um, so these monarchic bloodlines are essentially Satanist all the way down, you know, back all the way through the history of Western civilization, um, going back to um, Egypt and Atlantis. Um, so there's really an unbroken line, um, cultivated bloodline. Um, so I do come from those lines, um, and they took an outsized interest in me, partly for that reason. Um, and it's made this lifetime very complicated um, so far. Uh, yeah. I'll say, <laughs> do you know exactly from which bloodline you, you descend? Well, um, if I understand it correctly, um, it's the most direct link is to the French royalty, the Merovingians. Um, and um, some of, uh, I, yeah, some other build lines that I don't understand as well yet, but um, that would be one of the main ones. Um, so according to some people, they say that you, you would be linked to Jesus. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you know this to be true? This is not just a Dan Brown, um, what's it called, Angels and Demons, and what's the other one? Yeah, no, it's not a. It's not just a novel. Um, Jesus had many children. Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, um, and they had a very large family. Um, and Mary settled in southern France, and um, the yeah, a lot of the um, royal bloodlines of Central Europe are related to them. Yeah. Do you think that Jesus and also Mary Magdalene, whom we, interestingly enough, are talking a lot about these days, uh, also on the channel, a lot of people are talking about the history specifically of her and the mystery surrounding her and also that Pat, those the, her history in France. But do you yeah. think that these were real people that walked the earth? Or do you think that this is a, like a metaphor, symbolism, in her case, for the Holy Grail, the vagina? Uh, that's a funny way to ask it. Um, I'm sorry I, these to are be real, so direct. Yeah, no, it's all right. These are real people. They're flesh and blood people. Um, yeah, there's also obviously a tremendous amount of mythology around them. But um, yeah, they were ordinary human beings. And you know this because this was what you were educated to believe. You were around people who were able to go through the different timelines and travel in terms of time uh, yeah. travel or what? Um, yeah, essentially, I had a lot of time travel experiences um, through the Montauk project, and um, I saw a lot of these things for myself. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely part of my experience is direct observation of these things. Yeah. So going back to your childhood, your mother was a sex worker. Mm -hmm. overground, as you say, and she was yeah. a mind-controlled victim, maybe MK Ultra or Project yeah. Monarch, a yeah. sex slave and the, herself, but yeah, she was later. also abusing you as a child sexually. This is what your story is. And of course, this, this will be startling to a lot of viewers watching this. And uh, how often would she, uh, would she uh, abuse you sexually? Uh, quite often, um, conservatively, uh, several times a week for many, many years. Yeah. And why would she do that? Uh, well, a lot of it is designed to break down a person's mind and to have them separate into different alters to have them develop dissociative identity disorder um, or what used to be called multiple personality disorder um, so this is an intentional strategy um, overwhelming trauma of any kind is used to fragment people but most especially sexual trauma um, because it really gets to the root of your ego very quickly um, and um, enables it to be broken into pieces yeah so we're obviously talking about a compartmentalization of the brain and the mind in order to create alters mm -hmm. that can work through trigger words and and uh, signs or whatever. You can probably speak to that as well. 
So yeah. she did not do that, uh, well, deliberately because she, um, she enjoyed that herself or what? Did she do that because she was programmed to do it or forced to do it? How would you explain it? Yeah, primarily she was forced to do it. Um, I'm sure there were some assaults that where she was just acting erratically, but um, generally speaking, it was in very controlled conditions. Um, and she was directed to do this in a very specific way by her own handlers. Um, so again, this is a very intergenerational thing. You know, it's been running in my family for a long time. Um, so the parents and the grandparents, you know, have their own handlers and they're all interlinked and the handlers are also multi-generational. You know, the handlers themselves are usually bloodline people. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of intergenerational, um, intentionality here. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So generally, um, I mean, my mother and I shared some of the same handlers, um, and then I had my own and she had her own. Um, but this was all very controlled. Yeah. And who were those handlers? Can you talk about who they were? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of them would appear to be ordinary people outwardly. Um, my main one was named Patrick. Um, I haven't come up with his last name yet. I probably eventually will figure it out. Um, but uh, that was probably my closest one emotionally. Um, and by day, he was a New York City police detective. Um, so he, you know, he was living a very outwardly lawful life. <laughs> yeah. So this this is what we hear a lot that it's a lot of those people who actually work for either the, the government or are in high ranking positions that are involved in these in these satanic uh, circles, obviously. Is, and so is yeah. he. Yeah, that's true. But what did in, but can you talk about what 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 happened to you? What what he did and and how he got you involved as a child? How, how old were you? Uh, I was involved from birth. Um, from even from before birth, uh, as I was in the womb, my mother was um, shot up with all sorts of chemicals, um, and spiritual warfare was being waged against me, against my soul while I was still in the womb. Um, so this is from my earliest memories, from before anything I can consciously remember. Um, and then, and as soon as a person's born, as soon as I was born, I should say, um, rather than talking about it in the abstract. Um, as soon as I was born, um, I was subjected to extremely intensive neglect and torture. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I, I was being shocked, electroshocked, um, and had needles put into my skin and, um, was left to starve for full days at a time. I mean, by, you know, as soon as I came out of the womb, as soon as I was born, this was happening. So, yeah, you went through torture and what kind of torture you also talk, what happened at these satanic rituals? How far back can you remember? My earliest conscious memories, uh, probably started to form around two years old. Um, and, um, I, I, I remember some of the things that I've mentioned, um, shock and um, pain from needles. Um, I remember some very early rapes, um, you know, when I was really unable to react in any way physically. Um, I mean, I, my, my own memories um, start to come in around, yeah, two to three. Um, there are earlier experiences which I've observed in meditation, you know, looking at my body from the outside. Um, and of course I was forced to leave my body a lot in the moment. Um, cause that's how you survive these experiences. Um, so my spirit would just be there floating around the room and I could observe what was happening. Um, and so some of the memories, when I go back into them, it's from that perspective, it's from this detached perspective kind of floating above it. Um, which is very common for extreme trauma survivors of all kinds. Um, so, 
Yeah, I, I am aware of a lot of things that happened before I had conscious memory um, through this method, through spiritual methods, sitting with it in meditation and just observing. Um, that's also how I know about a lot of the womb torture, things that happened before I was conscious. Um, also, as soon as I was conscious, I was being split off into different personalities and I was being um, taught to respond to different names. Um, even at a time when I was barely verbal, you know, I, I, I barely had a self-concept at all. Um, but that's when these things start because they want to get them in very deeply. Um, so from a young age, um, I was fragmented and taught to respond to different names. Um, and my host there, and so I'm going to use some DID terms. Um, the host is usually considered, um, sort of the organic personality of the body. Um, the person who would be there if there was no torture. Um, and one of the first tasks of the satanic handlers is to banish that host personality somewhere where it's never going to be accessed to bury, to bury it under layers and layers of shame. Um, so in my case, and this is very common, um, I was forced to murder an adult person, um, basically with a knife put into my hand by an adult and with an adult holding my hand and, um, murdering this adult who was incapacitated, probably drugged, um, this is a very, very common initiation in the cults. So again, this is not unique to me. Um, and after that experience, I was intensely shamed, um, and shocked and, um, essentially told that my host had done it. Um, and my host personality was given the name of Jeremy. Um, so this Jeremy altar, um, was banished to a very, very deep place inside me where I couldn't really access him. Um, and, uh, I became very dissociated from my organic personality. Um, yeah. And thereafter developed a whole host of other personalities, um, which were not really part of my core, which were more, um, created by my handlers. Yeah. So how many personalities would you say that you actually had? How many did they split you into? Well, I was a polyfragmented system, which means that the parts have parts. Um, so if you count all the parts of parts, it winds up being dozens. I mean, easily over 30, um, conservatively. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in terms of core parts, um, parts that are then fragmented further, um, there were seven main ones seven main ones and mm -hmm. they all had different personality traits or what some were nice some were not nice some were killers or yeah yeah some were trained for killing some were trained for uh retaining information um for spying essentially blackmail um some were trained to um function well in school you know, I, I still had a front life. I, I make a distinction between a front life and a back life. So in my front, in my front life, I did many things which are more expected and common and legal. You know, um, <laughs> I went to school and I, I had a, a public personality. Um, so, so the public facing system there, there were one or two main altars. Steven was the name of the main altar who was responsible for, um, interacting with the public and going to school. Um, and um, I was trained to retain information. So I I never really had to do my homework. You know, if, if anything was said in the classroom, I would remember it immediately. Um, I wouldn't have to study or anything. Um, and so I was able to get by in school and get pretty good grades without ever doing my homework, without ever doing anything really sane at home. <laughs> uh, I was able to kind of float through school because I had that training. Um, so yeah, I had, I had, um, and I, I had altars for, um, for, for sexuality, for, for rape and for breeding, um, from a very young age. Um, I was trained, uh, essentially as a sex worker myself, um, from long before puberty. Um, I was trained to act like I was a consensual sex worker for adults. Um, so I had altars that were trained for that and they would be out in the front um when i was being sexually assaulted yeah and these were obviously predatory honestly a lot of these people are not really pedophiles in terms of their personal orientation 
Um, it's something that they're doing for power within the cult. Um, so very few of them would actually be pedophiles in terms of what they would actually choose to do in their free time. Yeah. So they were only pedophiles because they were part of the satanic cult. And this is what they do inside of those circles uh, in order to do what to summon Satan or in other words, like these dark entities, archons, uh, jinns, what have you. Uh, yeah, that's a part of it. There's definitely a spiritual side of it, too. Um, a lot of it is very practical, what I've been discussing so far, um, just to have someone who you can make to do all these different tasks. Um, but yeah, the core, the core, the core of it, the heart of it, um, a lot of it is about um, having people possessed by forces other than themselves. Um, um, so the victim is essentially possessed by the handler and there are altars who are just an internalized version of the handler that's exactly what they are so you feel like they have you have them inside you um and then there are internalized versions of uh, a lot of different non-physical beings um yeah satan being one of them um where you feel like satan is watching you all the time um and that's also part of the training um whether that is a real force is um, is debatable as far as I'm concerned. Um, I mean, clearly the actions people are taking are real. Um, clearly there are malevolent forces moving through the people. Um, whether those can really be personified as Satan, I, 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 I'm agnostic about, I'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> Some yeah. people claim, David Icke and others, claim that they are that they're actually summoning these these beings and they may be in fact reptilian overlords yeah. that they as they call them, these ET alien beings, reptilians that look yeah. and they and Satan has been portrayed a bit like that, right? Yeah, th this is true. Yeah, I should I should definitely speak to that. Um, so above the human handlers generally are draconians, reptilians, handlers. Um, and generally, they're in a much more cogent place and they're, mu they they're much more um, in, in control of themselves and their actions. Um, almost all of the humans are dissociated as well. And so they're not meaningfully in control of their own actions, most of them, even going to very high levels within the cult. Um, almost all of the people going up many levels of leadership are, are essentially acting their whole lives from a place of fear. Um, they never really experience empowerment, you know, they're, and they're, they're kind of on autopilot in, in a lot of ways that matter. Um, generally the conscious handlers, rarely they're human beings more frequently they're they're draconians yeah so i do have a lot of firsthand experience with these reptilian beings yeah so shape shifting is real and they do take human form and this and these reptilian this reptilian rule behind behind the scenes behind the political system and the secret space program and everything we've heard about for years and years lots of people have talked about it not just david Icke, obviously so yeah. you would you will confirm that this is real it's definitely real yes have you seen a reptilian yes can we hear about it Sure. Um, I had quite a few in my life. Um, some of them shape shift into human form. Some of them don't. Um, generally speaking, they're usually seven feet tall, sometimes taller. Um, they have dark green skin and yellowish eyes. Um, and some of their features are like you might expect of a normal lizard, just at a much bigger size. So that is a valid reference point. Um, generally, they have long, thick tails. Um, and um, they have a very powerful presence. Um, usually, they smell really, really bad. Um, and um, generally, I mean, the times that I've seen them, generally, I've been in states of extreme fear, extreme abuse. I've been on various tranquilizers and other drugs. Um, so, uh, I've, I've pieced this together from memories that are extremely warped. Um, 
However, I am confident that these are actually reptilians. They're not just people in costumes. You know, it's not a fantasy or something like that. Um, yeah, they, they're physically real beings like you and me. So you have been able to retrieve your memories and remember that this is these things actually manifested in front of you and before you, I mean, in terms yeah. of being real. And some you say shape, you saw the shape shifting from a yeah. human form into reptilian. This is true. Um, at high levels of the cult leadership, it's a very, very normal thing to see them. It's an everyday thing. It's not something exotic. Um, this is how the cults are controlled. Um, and the top level leadership is very conscious of this. And they're in person. They're, they're in contact in person with these reptilians on a very regular basis. Um, so I just want to say that um, once you're at certain levels, this is a normal thing. Um, I, I was being groomed to be a handler myself. And so especially during that training, when I was, when they were trying to make me into a handler, um, that's when I saw the reptilians the most, because that's when I was exposed to the top leadership a little bit more. When you were exposed to the top leadership, so to speak, and you were amongst these beings and also humans in, on, on that level, who, who were, I mean, who, who are these beings or these people? Are those the royal family that David Icke has talked about or yeah. other prominent people? Who can you mention? What did you see? It's not just the average Joe, is it? Uh, generally not. Um, I mean, it, it happens, but it's extremely rare. Um, yes, usually these are public figures. Um, I can confirm um, the royal families of most um, European countries at least are definitely shape-shifting reptilians. Um, if they're, if they're not full-blooded, then they're heavily hybridized. So they're, they're reptilian human hybrids. Um, but the, but the top ones, um, like yes, the British Royal family, um, they are full-blooded reptilians and they fully shape-shift from human to reptile. Um, so that does happen. Um, and then there's a lot of gray area um, because there are a lot of hybrids, um, a lot of people who are part reptilian to various degrees. Um, I have some reptilian DNA personally. Um, it's it's not enough to where I can full on shape shift. You know, it's 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 a much more subtle alteration. Um, but there's there's a very wide spectrum, and there's been a lot of hybrid hybridization over the millennia. Yeah. So when you talk about the British royal family, which of course is very shocking to a lot of people, and that's why David Icke and others have been, been ridiculed for years, but I mean, when did you see them? Why were you privy to have this experience? I was trafficked all over the world. Um, again, especially when I was being groomed to be a handler, um, I was brought all over the place, all over the world. Um, and underground and off planet, I was brought like to a lot of places that people usually don't see. Um, so um, one of those places was the UK and I do have some personal experiences with the British Royals in person. Um, and then in New York, just at home, many people came internationally from different satanic um, families um, and different political groups, satanic political groups um, to uh, to, to pray on children and to have meetings between each other, international meetings. Um, one place that I can name, um, which I haven't named before is the UN. Um, the UN is a satanic organization. Um, so I'd be brought over, um, you know, to the East, East Midtown in New York city is where the UN building is. Um, and I'd be exposed to all sorts of international leaders, um, who are either full-blooded, reptilians or um, hybrids who would who would also shapeshift yeah so now we're talking about people on a political level or a part of the royal bloodline because a lot of these so-called well uh heads of states and all of that or prime ministers and they're known to just be pawns and just be there for a few years and be possible well, of course a member of the Bilderberg group and chosen yeah. and all that but you know a lot of people say they're just part of it but they're not really in the know but you say a lot of them are in the know and some are yeah. even reptilians yeah yeah 
Yeah, some are pawns, some are some are more active. Um, yeah, it really depends on the individual. Um, yeah, um, I can say, um, yeah, I, I encountered quite a few political types who seem to be um, in control of themselves um, and, you know, uh, participating in a more conscious way. Yeah. You were used, abused sexually by these men or women? Or both? both. Yeah, both. Um, so, yeah, people are raised very frequently to be bisexual um, in a cult context, whatever their natural orientation is, you know, gay, straight, whatever. Um, everybody who goes through this experience is intensively trained um, to open up their sexuality and be attracted to lots of different genders and ages and all that stuff. So just to say that. Um, one person I can name specifically is Boutros Boutros Ghali. Um, he was uh, at the UN and he was... He was the general trainees. secretary of the UN, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, secretary general, yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. From uh, some African country, right? Um, I'm not remembering in this moment. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, and yeah. neither can I. But but you were... So he abused you sexually as a child. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he was involved very deeply in rituals. I would have to chant his name. Um, and that was a whole, <laughs> like, butchos, butchos, gali, butchos, butchos, gali. And so that I do have memories where that's happening. Um, yeah. So it's very personal sometimes. <laughs> My God. Well, um, and who else did, uh, did you see some of the, I mean, you saw the British Royal family, maybe not the I UN, did. I would expect, but you saw some other political figures. How about the American presidents? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Clintons were there. Um, definitely, um, saw most of the Clinton family. Um, I, I was a little bit close to Chelsea Clinton for a while. Um, she was also being used inside of this system. Um, I can also name the Schumers, um, you know, Chuck Schumer, Amy Schumer. Um, these are New York politicians. I don't know if they're known internationally. Um, sure they are. But yeah, um, they were, they were at these rituals as well. Um, yeah. And, um, parts of the Trump family there too. Um, so it's not a, it's not a Republican or a Democrat thing, a right or a left thing. Everybody's involved. So the in this. Trump family was there as well, and you, yeah. you speak specifically about Donald Trump. Yeah, I, I have memories of him being at these parties. A lot of people, and this is dividing the truth movement at the moment, as you probably know, about whether you well well believe in Trump and that he's a good guy and that he will stop uh, sex trafficking and get all the children over ground and all of these things, children in dumps. But yeah. what is your take on this? You're now saying that you saw him there at these rituals. This is true. Um, yeah, I don't think he's going to get any children free, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I think it's going to take a grassroots, grassroots movement of the people um, to have any meaningful change. Um, anybody who's selected by the Democratic or Republican National Convention is going to be part of the Satanic establishment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and who yeah. else can you mention? This is extremely vital for this conversation. There are still altars inside of me um, who uh, are very, very scared about releasing different information. Um, so it's a process within myself. You know, it's part of the healing journey. Um, and um, these are some names that I've spent some time with and decided to go public with. Um, but others, um, I have to really go in within myself and um, be as gentle as I can with these altars who are very scared, um, you know, to to get everybody on board. So, um, yeah, it's, it's important for me that I have the full consent of my whole system um, for these things. So yeah. you're reluctant and scared about certain people and to mention them, but other people, you, you've come to terms with it and you can talk about them as you just did. Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. According to Kathy O'Brien, who's of course a quite a famous uh, MK Ultra victim and who's been speaking out for years about her child childhood, she uh, claims that she saw George Bush, the old, the first president, yeah. 
mm-hmm. shapeshift, uh, but also said that she thought it was some kind of a mind control technique. But maybe he actually did. But she did talk about that. And he certainly was very abusive to her. Also, another mind control victim, Bryce Taylor, has written a long book about this. Thanks to the memories, if we can believe all of that. Yeah, I think that's all true. Um, and I don't think it's a mind control trick. I think they do literally shapeshift. Yeah. Um, and OK, I did. I did see the bushes <laughs> now that we're on the subject. Um The the younger Bush, um, I was actually very fond of. Um, he really didn't obey the handlers. Um, he was a very sweet man. Um, so I just want to want to say that the elder Bush was very very evil. Um, you know, not a good bone in his body. Um, and a lot of the people that surrounded them, you know, Donald Rumsfeld and all all those people from um, the Bush administration. Um, you know, they were very very compromised um and i believe the younger bush was killed and cloned for his disobedience um so i'm i'm pretty sure he's a clone at the moment the one now or the one who was probably behind 9 11 uh the one now yeah but the one before the original one was behind 9 11 Or was it the people behind him and his father? Uh, both. Again, this is this. It can't be stressed enough. This is a, a very multi generational thing. Um, actually, if you want to know about 9-11 specifically, um, you might want to have Wendy Hoffman on your show if she's available. Um, she, yeah, part of part of her book, um, The Enslaved Queen, which is very good. I also recommend a uh, survivor memoir. Um, she describes some of the rituals that went into. Um, planning the whole 9-11 experience. Um, and it's it's very nice. It's very detailed. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, well, and thanks for so, recommending that. We'd love to have her on the show. Yeah. I'm not sure if she's um, public at, anymore, if she's around anymore. Um, but uh, I loved her memoir. And um, these events that really change public perception, they're planned for generations. It's not something that Bush came up with personally. This has been in the works for 50, 60 years easily. So that's important to know. And some people also claim that the Twin Towers were actually built uh, in the late 70s. And they were I think they were done by 73 or something. They were built in order to be brought down. Yeah, essentially. Um, 77, if memory serves. Um, yeah, there there were very profound satanic rituals going into the construction of those towers. And yes, they were designed for the for the 9-11 experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you also talk about other, I mean, when you did see the uh, British royal family shapeshift and you were part of those rituals, were you brought to England to Windsor Ca Castle or where? I was. Yeah, I was sometimes. Um, they there there are certain certain groups, Luciferian especially, um, where uh, people are still brought back to Europe um, to do the rituals. Um, there are versions of them that happen in the U.S., um, but for some of them, especially the very high-level ones, um, you're going to get flown to Europe um, to, to participate in them. So I do have a lot of those types of experiences. Um, and before I forget, actually, I should mention while we were on the subject of the World Trade Center, um, I have a lot of ritual abuse memories in those buildings when they were still standing. Um, so I should mention that. Do you really? Yeah. What 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 took place there? Please, please share that with us. <sighs> well, the World Trade Center had a number of underground levels, um, some of them open to the public, some of them closed. And on some of those levels um, were spaces specifically dedicated for sex trafficking and ritual abuse. Um, And uh, yeah, and I experienced a great deal of of that in that space. <laughs> yeah, underneath the ground, not just in the garage. We we saw that when the mm. when, when everything was taken down. But I mean, yeah. levels below that, or what? Yeah, yeah, there were levels below that as well. Mm -hmm. How many levels? At least sixteen that I personally witnessed. 
16. So that means it would go further down. But people that worked like overground or in the in the lobby, so to speak, they had no access to go there or what? No, I don't think so. But how could you go there then? Um, well, I well, I I don't know if I can say for sure because um, when I was brought there, I would often be semi-conscious or unconscious. I'd be on a lot of different drugs. Um, but again, when I look at the situation spiritually from a meditation standpoint, which is how I get to clarity about these things, um, there were definitely elevators that were not open to the public um, that we were brought into. So, yeah. And you so remember was... entering the building? I mean, the Twin Towers, one of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, many times. Yeah, Patrick, my um, police department handler, brought me there quite a lot. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, uh, what what took place there, and is it is it significant to your the overall story of this horrendous life that you led as a child and 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 unfortunate unfortunately had? Is it is it important that you uh, went to specific places? Were they like ritual? Were they they have like a, s a certain kind of magic surrounding them, or what? Was it yeah. important? Yeah, a lot of these locations, um, like the World Trade Center, especially globalist institutions, I mean, the World Trade Center, the UN building that I mentioned, um, when these places are built, um, it's with an intense amount of visioning. Um, and the spaces that are created um, are, uh, are very, very high energy spaces um, that, are, that are devoted to um, higher dimensional evil beings and devoted to the reptilians. Um, so, so some of these spaces have the feeling of a temple. Um, you know, they're, they're very immaculate spaces. Um, and, um, with a lot of impressive, you know, marble and, um, it's like very, um, imposing, you know, high ceilings, very imposing kind of designs, like religious structures of other kinds. Um, so these are designed basically as churches, um, and there are altars in these spaces, um, which are used for the rituals. Um, so it's very, very religious, um, and they're designed much like other religious buildings. Yeah. But satanic. Yeah. So take us through, if you can, if you can share this with us, it would be very important. Take us through what actually, uh, what you were exposed to, what happened at these satanic rituals, what, what was done to you? Um, <laughs> it's difficult to summarize in brief. There was quite a variety of experience over the years. Um, generally speaking, um, I would be raped and sexually trafficked. Um, I would, uh, have to engage in violence, um, and witness a lot of violence, other children and adults, um, being killed, being tortured in many sadistic ways. Um, and, um, for some of the more, um, advanced rituals, there were more supernatural activities that that were happening. People would be possessed. There was a lot of channeling. Um, and there there would be a very palpable presence sometimes at these rituals of um, a higher dimensional entity coming in um, and possessing people. So there is this spiritual aspect as well. Um, yeah. They're, they're not very creative, the Satanists. Um, so a lot of their activities are going to just kind of recycle these different activities in different ways. Um, yeah. So that is the way it works. So they don't have to be creative or that's, they, they know the horrible form, the dark formula and they use that every time. Is that, is that, is that how it works? More or less. Yeah. Um, some of these events were less religious. They were more, had a more social atmosphere, a party atmosphere. Um, and that's where you'd see um, kind of the the more civilian people, like very rich people, um, would come to these parties that 
Um, in a general vibe, I mean, kind of are are similar to like consensual sex parties, swinger parties. You know, they're, sometimes they have that vibe, um, except also, um, obviously, you have children there and you have people being very actively harmed there. A lot of illegal stuff happening. Um, so they're invite only, obviously. Uh, but um, yeah, that's that's another general category of thing that would happen. Um, you'd have these very, very dark sex parties um, with a lot of rich people. Um, and, you know, doing, doing a lot of um, more common things, you know, s- snorting cocaine and... Um, uh, but for some, for some of them, it, it's their way of enjoying themselves, and it's less of a religious thing. Um, yeah. So you're talking a little bit like what we're hearing now, which is being exposed publicly about Diddy, for example, and mm-hmm. and those things going on in Hollywood. But though that's also still a little bit, you know, t- tip of the iceberg, right? And also, yeah. Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, were you involved with any of those? Um, yeah, I, I didn't know Epstein well, but I did see him, um, at some of these events. So the reason I'm able to talk about these things coherently is because I've done a fair bit of therapy. (laughs) Um, and every time I go into a new area of experience, I kind of need to process it a little bit. Um, so that's an area that I haven't really spent time with consciously as an adult, um, which I, which I ought to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, the reason oh, so who Coolio, do you think who did you see? Well, the reason Coolio jumped out in my memory is because I actually did a photo shoot with him um, as a child, um, at, which you may know from other interviews. Um, I was being groomed to be an actor and a model, and I I was in different modeling situations. Um, so um, one of the photo shoots I did was with him, um, which I think that's that's why he jumped into my mind immediately because I have much more conscious memories of that happening um that was something in my front life um where uh you know where where i was actually um or my family was actually paid openly and you know it was more like a commercial photo shoot um so that's kind of why that jumped out i don't Um, know my i don't know a lot of these rappers yeah i'm gonna have to spend some time to really um meditate on that and um maybe maybe bring it up in therapy because i um yeah it's an area that i just haven't touched but but i'm i'm getting more uh more able to bring these things out and it is important to name all these names um and go into the musical side of things um is there anybody else you can mention woody harrelson um definitely um i would see quite a bit um yeah i think this is an area where i need to commune with myself a little bit more before i um go public um yeah i i also met a lot of actors as i was being trained for that kind of role um so um yeah i there are parts um i i still have um i have to kind of talk to myself and talk to my alters and um but but yeah. did you experience any uh sexual abuse by any of these celebrities mm-hmm. um i mean the short answer is yes definitely um i just um um i just think i should come back to that maybe another time and so i can be more specific with it and less triggered yeah so you're still in this process i'm 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 feeling that you don't have you've not retrieved all of your memories you still have the compartmentalization in your mind you're still trying to come to terms with it even though you apparently have been speaking about this for quite some years now so i mean how, how does this work well it hasn't been that long um i've been public for less than 10 years um i've been free for about 20 years um and um, my first public interview, I believe, was 2017. Um, I was talking about it a little bit before that, um, 2016, 15. But um, that's when I really came out. So this is still relatively new 
I mean, for a ritual abuse survivor, this this is ten years can can be a very short time, <laughs> um, because the depth of the trauma that you're dealing with is very very intense. Um, I mean, anybody who has intense trauma, even non cult related, um, you know, you you'll you'll know how it is. Um, it takes years to to get clarity about things and to not be very deeply triggered about things, talking about them. Um, so yeah, I'm still in process. Um, I mean, I've come a long way. I'm at the point where my whole system is co-conscious. So we don't have any unconscious alters, I don't think. Um, and we're all cooperating and functioning as one person, um, which is a big step for a, D for a DID system. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff will be relevant mostly to other survivors and not so much the general public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so almost 10 years. And um, interestingly enough, we have never met before. And so it's interesting to yeah. uh, to, to to meet you now well, because we've heard, yeah. I've heard so many stories now, but it's it's so fascinating. We've never really crossed paths yet. Yeah. Well, to get more specific, um, I've been pretty slow in coming out about a lot of things, um, partly to honor my own healing process and partly to honor my family. Um, so when I initially came out, uh, my adoptive father was still alive. So I was adopted by a non-cult person um, later in life, which is another reason I'm coherent at the moment. <laughs> um, And um, my adoptive father was very, very scared about me going public. Um, I, I still did. He, he passed away in 2019. Um, so my initial interviews, um, I was pretty careful not to talk about things involving this body and this lifetime. I talked about things from the more past life perspective because um, I really wanted to honor his fear um, and move slowly. Um, but... Um, My my adoptive father committed suicide um, in 2019. Um, so, I mean, it was devastating, but it also started to free me up a little bit to speak more publicly about things. So kind of after I'd had some time to process that, like 2020, 2021 is when I really, you know, started coming forward more about stuff in this body on this timeline. Um, so it's been a very gradual process. Um, and my mother committed suicide barely a year ago. Um, so there were also parts of me that were, um, you know, still had a lot of feelings. We're, we're essentially trying to protect her or we're still loyal to her in some way. Um, so it's been an organic process. Um, and a big part of the reason I'm, I'm naming names now and I'm being more specific now, um, is because those people have passed away. My God, this is unbelievable, really, to hear this. So obviously, it's relatively new for you to come out and really talk so explicitly and, and everything you're doing now about what happened at that time and your mother was still alive. It's only a year ago, apparently. Yeah. That she yeah. committed suicide as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the trauma and the sexual uh, abuse happened, uh, you know, that was her doing it a lot yeah. as well. Yeah. So I mean, and but you still talked about it while she was alive. How did she? Uh, do you think that played a part in her committing su suicide? It's hard to say. Um, she was very detached from our reality, um, so it's hard to attribute any rational motivations to her. Um, that's something that I've had to learn. <laughs> it's really helped my healing a lot. Um, if you try to understand perpetrators on a rational level it's really not going to work. <laughs> This is not a rational process. It's something really, really sick. And the whole, the whole thought process, it's something that we just can't relate to, you know, as people whose consciences are awake. Um, it's just really not doable. Um, so that's another piece, um, which again, is probably more helpful for survivors, but, um, But this is also important if, if there are survivors watching this show. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. And for all the survivors who are watching, um, I hope this serves as encouragement to believe yourself more um, and to allow yourself to integrate your alters, to go into your own memories. 
um, maybe eventually to go public if and when that's right for you. Um, I think it's really, really important that, well, A, that more of us heal, that's really the critical thing, um, and B, that more of us come out and start talking. Yeah. So um, why, I mean, if you've been, as you said, free for about 20 years, yeah. why couldn't you help your mother? Was that too difficult because you were in this deprogramming depro process yourself and she was not able to heal? She was not able to deprogram or what? Um, well, she wasn't free, so she wasn't a safe person to be around. Um, she still had her handlers in her life up until the very end. Um, I mean, I, I heard, yeah, th this gets very um, tender still, but um, some of the other patients um, at the mental hospital where she was, um, so she spent most of the last years of her life in a mental hospital. Um, some of the other patients told me she was still being sexually trafficked, like from the hospital. So this is, you know, she did not get free. She was still enslaved. But yeah. how old was she at that time? She would have been in her 60s, but yeah. And they would still, still use people sexually at that age? Yes. But, but can you talk about why that is and how that can be? This is a lifetime thing. Um, for people that are in the cult for life, you're raped from birth till death. It never stops. Um, and I mean, some of that is for breeding, but obviously if you're dealing with postmenopausal people, um, it's just for pure malice and humiliation and mind control, but it continues. It, it doesn't stop. So your mother was, uh, trained, uh, programmed since childhood to be a breeder, a lot of children. How many, how many children did she have other than you? Uh, it's hard to say exactly. Um, I was a twin, so I had a twin brother, um, who, uh, didn't have a front life. He was kept in underground places. Um, I'm not sure if he ever even got a civilian identity, a social security number, things like that. I'm not sure. Um, but he passed away, um, around the same time as my adoptive father, um, which is another factor that's honestly freeing me more to talk about these things. So your twin brother uh, died around 2019 as well, but he did not have a front life. Yeah, he was kept hidden. But where, how do yeah. you know about him then? Did you uh, were you able to stay in contact with him? I wasn't. Um, the only memories I have of him are from childhood, and they're very few and far between. Um, the only reason I know about this is because um, because of my psychic work and my meditation. Yeah, I I still don't have like three D confirmation of his passing, um, and I I may not get it, but um, energetically I know he's gone. Yeah. So through this work, as a when you do the your meditation and your psychic work, you're mm -hmm. a. I mean, a lot of people will be very skeptical when they hear this and think, "Oh, he's just sitting there meditating, getting all this information. How can it possibly be true?" But mm -hmm. I mean, you were your senses senses were heightened. Your yeah. a, your ability to do what psychic work was like programmed in a different way since yeah. earth right so yeah. you have yeah. abilities that go beyond the normal the regular person this is true yeah i was trained for psychic ability um anybody can develop these skills you know um whether or not you even have an aptitude for it it can be developed just like anything else just like um you know becoming a car mechanic you know these things are trained um so i want to normalize that like everyone is psychic this is not something that only a few people are. It's just an ability that we all have. Um, so that's worth saying. <laughs> um, and then within the cult, I was trained for a lot of different psychic observation tasks. It It is part of why it comes easily to me now, um, because I was trained for it. Yeah. Can you talk about what you were trained to do and your abilities? Uh This is another thing that I'm just starting to talk about publicly, but um, 
Let us be the first. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> um, well, channeling of a lot of different kinds. Um, when I speak about possession during rituals, sometimes I was the one who was possessed um, and I was supposed to channel different higher dimensional beings um, for my handlers. So I was supposed to speak um, for some higher Draco beings who were off planet or who had passed away. Um, I was expected to speak for them to be their mouthpiece um, or sometimes for aspects of Satan itself or other lesser demons. Um, I was supposed to speak for them, be their mouthpiece. So I, um, I did that. That's a, that's a very obvious thing that I did <laughs> that I can speak about. Um, another thing is navigating timelines. Um, that's something, again, this is a skill that anybody can develop. It's not unique to me or unique to a certain bloodline. Um, but I was used as a navigator, um, in cult rituals that were trying to create the future. Um, they do a lot of divination and they do a lot of intention setting um, to create different scenarios. Um, and so I was used for that. I was used for information to give information about the future um, and also to help them create a desired darker future. Um, I, I was part of those kinds of scenarios. That's another purpose for the rituals that um, I didn't name yet. Um, yeah, there's a lot of psychic activity um at some of these rituals it's not just you know submission and deprivation and political you know fear mongering and stuff like that there's also a lot of like real spiritual activity going on um so, so did they, may i just jump in here again yeah. uh, alandra did they um manipulate the timeline that we are on now to change from what it originally uh, originally would have been I mean, like yes. going back, you talk about the UN, UN Agenda 21, like we're here yeah. in U UN Agenda 2030. They made this, yeah. the 17 goals there in nine, in uh, the, the conference in 1992 and all of that. So please address that. That's, I think that would be very important for people who are studying what is happening, you know, with the new world order and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of our history is, is very carefully engineered. Um, people are manipulated. Um, again, this has been going on for millennia. Um, we haven't really had, let's say organic, um, public events for quite a long time. I mean, obviously things still happen organically. It's not completely controlled. You know, nobody can completely control reality. So I don't want to give that impression. Um, you know, God or the universe goddess is much much greater than any of these groups so there's always randomness and there's always you know a living universe um they don't control the universe um that being said i mean every major war um of of you know with within our within generational memory um was completely engineered completely not necessary just something that the cult decided they wanted to happen um to give a big obvious example um the vietnam war i mean was essentially a massive satanic ritual you know that was the explicit purpose of it um and people who are in it they felt that you know they felt the darkness and the pointlessness and the malice of it you know obviously it was a very traumatizing experience oh another survivor that you might want to have on the show who talks about that is kurth barker um yeah, he has some wonderful books. Um, the first one is called uh, Satanic Abusers and Angelic Defenders. Um, and it's a very, very lucid memoir of his early experiences in the cult. Um, and he's one that I thought of because he explicitly talks about the Vietnam War being a satanic ritual. Um, yeah, he's lovely. Um, Do you have any contact info uh, on him? I don't think so. I haven't I haven't spoken to him personally. Maybe we uh, can exchange what, what the names were later. I, I'd love to to get in yeah. contact with them. Yes. Yeah, I would like that too. Um, yeah, some of these folks who have written books, like I, I, you know, I don't know if they do video interviews, but if they do, it would be it would be lovely. Um, so yeah. everything has basically been engineered for at least a uh, hundred years and probably a lot more. Uh, yeah. At and, the very uh, least. <laughs> and all the conflicts are not real. Also, the recent ones uh, with the the Ukrainian war, Russia, and mm -hmm. 
and Israel, obviously, and you are of yeah. Jewish, well, descent. Mm -hmm. Can you can you address that just briefly? What is going on that conflict at the moment? Uh, well, I'm not privy to all the details, obviously, um, but um, there are intense conflicts over Stargates in the region. Um, so a lot of it ties in with the secret space program. Um, if you've had Stuart Swerdlow on, he talks about some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, um, whew, a lot of that conflict is directly being fed by the star nations and the star nations are essentially fighting each other through the middle East. Um, so it's a very, you can say a galactic proxy war. <laughs> um, there are things going on there that are well beyond the scope of earth. Um, so I just want to name that. Um, of course, in the immediate sense, I mean, I, I, I think what Israel's doing is unforgivable. Um, so I just want to say that that's like my personal political stance in the immediate moment. Um, but also I'm aware that the conflict is extremely multidimensional, you know, extremely intergalactic. So, yeah. Of course, and it's very important to address that. And in a way that also um, is related to what is going on at CERN, right, in Switzerland. Yeah, 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 this is true. Um, so, Have you ever been there during your childhood? or I have, yeah, um, particularly in the body before this one. Um, I've said this publicly before. Anytime you have a particle accelerator, it's going to be attached to... Uh, a branch of the Montauk project, essentially. Um, so this is this is the reason they build particle accelerators in the first place. Um, it's not just to answer like abstract scientific questions or to engineer some new industrial substance. Like you know, those are secondary goals. The primary goal of these projects is to manipulate our timelines and our energy. Um, so those particle accelerators are always one hundred percent of the time attached to some aspect of the Montauk project or or it's it's you know it's uh successors yeah that are very active that is very important and when we go into that past life section of your story and about Montauk which I'd like to do when we when we feel that we have gone through this lifetime you're in now yeah. uh, then I certainly would like you to address why Montauk specifically is so significant. But sure. uh, let's go into that when we get to to, to that uh, section here. But Makes still sense. talk about what you were groomed to become. You say that you were trained to become a breeder mm -hmm. because of your bloodline. What is your blood type and, and, why, and why? And a breeder, I mean, you started breeding, so to speak, when you were just a teenager, as soon as you became... Yeah sexually mature can you you've talked about this before but not to this audience so can you please yeah. talk a little bit about that even if it's difficult sure yes um well this is a little easier because i've already kind of talked about it a little bit but um my blood type is ab negative um and there's nothing better or worse about that than any other blood type um but the satanists are particularly interested in it um it's a relatively rare type um and um, they're interested in negative types. They're interested in AB um, because it relates to the Atlantean diaspora um, and it relates to um, some of the Slavs and some of the Jewish people, um, Eastern European Jews. Um, so, yeah, so I can name that. Um, and you are also Hungarian, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you talk about Eastern Europe. This just to, to get that in as well. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, I still have relatives in Hungary. Um, I would love to get get over there and um, try to meet some of them. Um, hopefully, they're not in the cult, but <laughs> um, I'm sure I some hope of them not. Are. Budapest is a beautiful city, though. So, um, well, I was used as a breeder for um, quite a long time. Um, puberty was induced a little bit prematurely um, in me. Um, I was put on a bunch of different hormones and hormone blockers and different things that I still don't quite understand. Um, but um, this is very common when the cult um, uh, assigns someone to be a breeder. Um, they'll put them through very intensive chemical uh, therapy 
or therapy, what a chemical treatment, um, to um, induce puberty early and to try to get them um, basically to feed their sex drive also um, and to, to create um, people that essentially live for sex, will do anything for sex. They, they, they create sex addicts and then they use that um, they bring the sex addicts into situations um, where they have partners that they want them to breed with. And, um, and, and because they're addicts, um, they'll do quite a lot. They'll withstand a lot of pain and suffering um, in order to keep having sex. Um, so this was the case for me. I was engineered into being a sex maniac. Um, and I, I have memories of uh, my mother um, drugging me and feeding me different, um, things that, um, were supposed to really, uh, feed that drive. Like I have a memory of my mother, um, cooking, um, Rocky mountain oysters, uh, bull testicles. Um, and so I, I would, she would serve them to me. I would eat them. Um, and that was like one of the things, um, in this cocktail of, um, you know, intense aphrodisiacs and dissociatives. Um, so, yeah, bull it's a very testicles and what? Yeah, that sounds horrible. What, uh, what? What? And what do they do when you eat them? Well, some people consider them a delicacy. I mean, this is a food that you're able to get at a restaurant. This is not like a secret satanic food. So just to say that, um, but uh, I mean, it's got really intense amounts of hormones in it. It makes you very, very horny. Um, is the short version? Yeah. So I mean. And when you would have, when your mother would sexually abuse you, I mean, the difference between being sexually abused by a man and, and then being sexually abused by a woman is slightly different when you're a boy because you have to be the performer, right? How did that actually work? If you, if you will, uh, if you want to address that or if you can address it. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, rape is rape. <laughs> you know, it's like whatever the genders are. Um, but yeah, in, in the case of boys or young men, um, uh, I would essentially be forced into having erections, um, whether chemically or by psychological manipulation or usually both. Um, so I was in a state where um, I would essentially have an erection for just about anything. I mean, even an inanimate object or I'd just be uncontrollably um, driven into having sex. So. Um, so a lot of the breeding that I was used for was under those circumstances, um, totally non-consensual, non-chosen erections. Yeah. So uh, that is what your mother took advantage of. And later on, and, and also at the same time, maybe other people, women and men that you were supposed to perform these sexual acts on. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Um, obviously the men were not used for breeding, but, um, <laughs> no, um clearly I, not. so yeah. when, when you had these experiences, these homosexual experiences by these people and were, so you received or, and you gave, is that, um, is that the expression? Yes. I mean, any conceivable position, um, I was put into, yeah. Giving, receiving, active, passive, whatever words you want to use. Um, yeah, it was all being done. Mm -hmm. So, and at that time you were completely confused about your own sexuality, your own true core sexuality. You didn't know what that was because everything was just uh, a blur, I guess. And, and you were yeah. programmed basically, but I mean, did it ever feel, what was it? Well, clearly it was a different experience every time, whether it was a man or a woman, but was it the same to you when you were in that state of mind in that altar mm, yeah for that altar it was kind of the same <laughs> um you know again i had just been made into a sex addict um and it what i would want in my heart um really didn't play into it at that time yeah um i mean there were people that i fell in love with because i am human you know um but it, but it and that, that gave me some clues later on, you know, as, as I was unpacking all these rape experiences, like uh, some clues about what my own sexuality might be. Um, but yeah, but for the most part, I mean, it was unthinking, unfeeling, 
you know, total drone mentality. Yeah. Did you ever come to terms with your sexuality and what you are, or is it st is it still a blur? Yeah, I'm very comfortable with it now, thankfully. Um, yeah, I'm in a pretty good place there. Um, I had I had some pretty good help in, in that area. Um, I went to um, some support groups for sexual assault that were very helpful. Um, I benefited a lot from the Wings Foundation in Colorado. Um, in the central U.S. So um, I went to school in Colorado and I went to these Wings Foundation groups. I recommend them very highly. Um, I don't know if anybody from their organization would be willing to speak about ritual abuse. Probably not. They're more mainstream. You know, they have state funding and stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but they were very useful to me and they helped me um, really um, clear a lot of the sexual trauma. That's where I started. Yeah. When one is looking at you now, you would not expect you to be a specifically uh, a sexual predator or being groomed for that or being a, yeah. ha having been a breeder and having gone through all of that. You wouldn't necessarily think that and you probably can't see that in a in a person generally. But I mean, how how is your how sexual are you now? Uh, Sorry about that. Know. It's probably very intrusive, but I mean, I'm just thinking: Is it? Have you been able to put a leash on that? Have you come to a yeah. more balanced? I mean, I'm talking about balance here, not not what you, not that. I mean, we're all sexual, right? But I yeah. mean, I'm just thinking: What? I mean, is it is it okay for you now to be in the body that you are in now? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm no longer a sex addict, thankfully. Praise be to the universe. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, actually, when I when I got free, um, the opposite thing happened. I totally shut down sexually. Um, so generally, if you have overwhelming sexual trauma, you're going to go in one direction or the other, right? It's going to be everything and you'll be obsessed with it or you'll freeze and like be totally unable to engage in sexual relationships. Um, so the interesting thing is when I got free and I was making my own decisions, um, I actually froze more than, more than acted it out. Um, and so I was sort of underactive rather than overactive when I became free. Um, yeah, but it was a totally different experience. I mean, if you've only ever had sex on all these drugs and in these really extreme violent circumstances, and then you get free, like, you know, it gave me some very, very bad associations with sex, obviously. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine sex without violence for years and years. Um, so that, that took a while. So can you talk about that? Have you, you have talked about this before, I, I think, I mean, what, I mean, so sex without violence was unthinkable for you in a way you couldn't yeah. think about that. Yeah. What, I mean, because violence always played a, a part when you had these sexual experiences. Yeah, at the very least, emotional violence. Yeah, if not outright physical violence. Yeah. When you were a child. Mm hmm Done, perpetrated by these grown-ups. Yeah. So you were, you were beaten, or what? Um, yeah, the physical torture in and of itself was very, very intense. I went through a lot of different kinds of physical torture. Um, Straight up beatings are not common in a cult context because um, especially if you're someone who has a front life and is not a full-time slave, um, you have to maintain your appearances for the public, you know. Um, so, so beatings are very uncommon. They don't want to leave bruises. They want to do things that don't leave marks. And so that's why I was talking about electrical shock and needles because these things don't leave bruises. They don't leave marks. Um, and that's very important. Um, I mean, How would they use a... needles, uh, Alandra? Um, well, I don't. I won't go into all the details because it's very gruesome. But um, a very common one is to have needles put under your fingernails, um, and the nerve endings there are very sensitive, um, and it causes excruciating pain. Um, and that's something that's never going to leave a mark, you know, and it's very hard to talk about. Um, yeah. Um, and then there are lots of different variations on it, um, all different parts of the body. Um, yeah, I, I, um, 
I, I don't know if it's helpful to go into all the details, but um, basically any part of the body is considered a target. Um, and for really advanced torture, they'll scan you psychically. They're using all of their psychic skills, some of the more conscious handlers, um, the ones that are closer to the Draco. They're using their psychic skills to evaluate you and look for what will cause the most pain and the most agony. And they'll go for that, whatever that is. You know, it's different for each person. Um, so, so it's hard to speak about in a general sense, but um, they're also using technology to observe your brain waves and track your pain responses. They, they use a lot of advanced technology in this process, and that's part of it that ties in with the secret space program stuff. Um, so from a young age, I would have, you know, various kinds of helmets on my head, various kinds of machinery that I would be hooked up to. And they're looking for what gives you the deepest pain. Um, and this is observable, you know, they can, they can see this on the brain waves, and then and they can also see it spiritually. Um, and so, you know, some people, for some people, it means a lot of physical torture. Other people um, are less attached to their physical body, but they care more about their emotional attachments. And so they're going to be manipulated emotionally. They'll be tortured through heartbreak, for instance, um, you know, repeated attachment trauma, psychological trauma. So um, it's not all physical either. Yeah. So it's also trauma when you um, like see something happening to others, like you saw other, you saw rich, I mean, people being sacrificed and yeah. animals being sacrificed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's sometimes for some survivors, that was the main way they were abused was having to witness others being tortured. Yeah. And when that happens, that is when the, because you can't cope with it because it's too terrible, then mm -hmm. you split into another altar in your mind. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Compartmentalization, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you, but you talk about that, that they, that they, um, you say that the soul can be measured in some kind of way and that the Illuminati type elite top players have the, the means, the technology or whatever to measure one's soul frequency in order to to discover what you can be used for and if you are a proper candidate for, for their uh, abuse purposes. Yeah. Is that true? How does that work? It is true. So um, they're looking for star seeds. You know, they're looking for very high vibrational souls who have had many other lifetimes, who are coming to Earth from other star systems. Um, they're definitely looking for that. Um, they're also looking in the conventional sense for um, intuitive people, you know, for intellectually bright people. Um, most of the talented and gifted programs in America's schools um, are run by the cult and the CIA. Um, so they're recruiting from these programs. Um, so there are intellectual tests and there are also spiritual tests and there are tests of your intuition. Um, and they're constantly testing people and they're always looking for um, for people to use. Um, but yeah, more more esoterically, they, they do look at the vibration of someone's soul. Um, and they can tell. I mean, it's even, even if you cultivate these senses within yourself, anybody can do this. Um, you can you can develop a sense in yourself of who's a young soul and who's an old soul. Um, and it's not always the person who's acting foolish, you know, who's the young soul or vice versa, you know. Um, but this is a sense that everybody can cultivate, a deeper heart knowledge that's available for anyone to cultivate. Yeah. So is that also what happens uh, from a distance that they can measure somebody's frequency in a way and yeah. then um, create targeted individuals? And we've yeah, had those absolutely. on the show as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the general population is being monitored. Um, by the CIA, by the NSA, and whatever the international equivalents are. Um, pardon my being an American and not knowing um, what they are <laughs> um, for you, but um, what what are, what are the um, ones in Denmark? I'm I'm so sorry. I I I, oh. I, 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 I didn't. I oh. don't know what you mean. What can you say? It oh, again? I'm sorry. I was just asking. What's your equivalent of like the CIA and NSA and stuff like that? It's called PET. PET. Oh, oh that, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Ooh, it's the same. It's the same. It's the Secret Service here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
That rings a bell as well. <laughs> oh, really? Do Gosh. tell. Well, it's it's pretty foggy right now, but I I'll get back to you about that. <laughs> but, oh, you're um, th that's quite a cliffhanger, Alondra, right now. Oh, I uh, well, hopefully you can edit some of this out, or you know, <laughs> I don't want to. I mean, yeah, there's I don't been quite a few cliffhangers but... hangers already tonight. Yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> fair enough. Okay, well, to return to the thread I was on, um, uh, which was, um, oh yeah, about your soul vibration and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, the general population is being monitored um, by the CIA and NSA. Um, and yes, if somebody has an exceptionally high vibration, even if you're not in a bloodline body, um, the state, the satanic state will take a great interest in you. Um, and some of the targeted individuals out there um, are not bloodline people. They don't have a ritual abuse background, um, but they're being targeted because of their high vibration. Um, so yeah, the general population is also being monitored quite intensively for these kinds of things. Um, and a lot of those targeted individuals are obviously not in the know. They just suffer severely from these attacks and this psychological warfare done to them or illnesses in the body. Yeah, this is true. Um, I've had I've had some moderate success um, helping people get out of those kinds of patterns. Um, so I do also work with targeted individuals who are not necessarily also ritual abuse survivors. Yeah. Yeah, this is so great and your work as a as a healer. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we could do a part two when we go into your time, your earlier past life at the mm -hmm. Montar project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how you were involved in that, how you yeah. retrieved all your memories. I'd like to talk about false memory syndrome also what you can talk about oh. that because could all of it all of what you're saying truly be real what 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 can you just say to that here in our remaining moments today oh well that's a whole subject so false memory syndrome is not a recognized psychiatric disorder it's not a valid thing um it was completely made up by the false memory syndrome foundation um, spearheaded by Elizabeth Loftus. She was a psychiatrist from the University of Washington. Um, and they made this up from whole cloth. I mean, they did exactly what they're essentially accusing survivors of doing. It was an organized movement within psychiatry to shut down survivors and discredit them. It's not an actual syndrome. So just to say that. Some people do say that these false memory syndrome, uh, that this false memory syndrome, syndrome was created by the CIA or these uh, secret space programmers, whatever, in order, in, as part of a mind control programming, in order to get a lot of victims to say that they saw aliens and ETs and have interaction with, with uh, otherworldly beings or satanic r rituals and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then they were doing something else like the MK Ultra uh program which is bad enough but i mean this is of course how it is explained often yeah um well that i mean they don't even have like a current website i don't think anymore um they basically went defunct when they had accomplished their mission which is to stop the first wave of satanic ritual abuse survivor disclosure um in the 80s and 90s um so there was a lull in survivors coming out. You might have noticed like from the early 2000s up until like the 2010s, there was like a good 10 years where you didn't like there weren't as many survivor memoirs published. You know, it was kind of it went a little bit underground for a while because of this organized movement to silence survivors. So, I mean, now we're kind of on the upswing again, you know. YouTube has been really helpful. Obviously, the video interview format is very, very helpful um, for survivors to be coming out. So there's been a bit of a, a renaissance. But but then again, like anytime you have survivors coming out en masse in large numbers, um, you're going to have these false memory syndrome people coming out. Um, and they'll probably come up with new language that's equally fakakta, you know, just like not real. <laughs> 
So, so you, so can we expect that all of these memories that you have and others, other people that were in this satanic cult, can we expect that they are all real? These memories, basically, on the whole, I mean, there's very little motivation for people to lie about these things. Like, this is extremely challenging to come out about. You know, it's not a walk in the park, um, and. Yeah, and I just don't see what's in it for people when they come out. I mean, when you come out, you get attacked on all levels. You get professionally attacked. You know, you can lose your job. You you can alienate family members. Like the consequences for coming out are very very intense, um, and there would be no reason to do it if you were making it up. So yeah, and that's a very important thing to to underline and to stress there, and and, and it's important for you to say that because. A lot of people will be, you know, um, uh, skeptical to say the least. And and if they really think about why would anybody do that, how, in what way would they would that benefit their lives? It's probably uh, it, that that it makes it pretty clear that no, a lot of people would not do that, right? Yeah, I mean, this is the the sort of attention that I dreamed of as a younger man revolved around my art. You know, I, I never thought I'd be like just talking about my personal life on, on news channels, you know, like <laughs> this is not this was not part of my plan. <laughs> that was another plan. But still, you are obviously a poet. I know you write poetry, you're a poetry yeah. writer, you are a mm -hmm. composer, you are mm -hmm. a musician and you create you have your own artistic world, which is which is very fascinating also and you do mm -hmm. healing and you do healing sessions mm -hmm. you do meditation therapy i suppose and uh yeah. coaching and uh and that is also something we can get more into in part two if you want to end t our conversation today and then we can go on and talk mm -hmm. about your experiences at the Montauk project and a lot of things we didn't get to cover about this lifetime. How, how, what yeah. do you say to that? Is that an that idea? Sounds good. Yeah, that feels good to me. I appreciate it. That's great. So um, I'd love we'd love to have you back very, very soon on Age mm -hmm. of Truth TV. Mm -hmm. And it's been absolutely totally fascinating and mind blowing and so far pretty outrageous and and moving to hear your mm. incredible story and you're quite brave for coming out and i want to thank you very much for that alandra yeah. thank you so much for taking your time to speak to mm. us you're so welcome thank you for having me i i love the work that you're doing too i mean it takes it takes uh some guts even to just bring sustained focus to all these things so i appreciate your courage as well Thank you so much. That means a lot. It's wonderful. And I can't wait to talk to you more and to see you again in in a very short time. Thank you so Excellent. much. Excellent. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. Great. Great. Thank you so much to Alondra Markman. And we're looking forward to part two very soon on the channel. And thanks to all of you for watching Age of Truth TV. You can support us by clicking onto our website, ageoftruth.tv. And please like our video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell for notifications. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website, ageoftruth.tv as well. Please also subscribe to our alternative channels on BitChute and Brighton. Your support is greatly appreciated and very needed. And on behalf of the Age of Truth TV team, we thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again soon.